I think it, it's interesting that really what Valentino came to represent is this, this kind of idea of European culture. You thought Rome, you thought Sofia Loren, Fellini, Antonioni, and Valentino. It wasn't about breaking new ground, but what it was about doing was, was adapting existing fashions and creating kind of seductive alternatives. He says he knows what women want. What women want is to look beautiful. Every Contessa and glamorous princess went to Valentino, and they still do. Valentino Garavanni was born in 1932 in a small village outside Milan. And his mother was a housewife. His father, I think, was a salesman for electrical cables. So there wasn't a very obvious fashion background, though an aunt, apparently, Aunt Rosa, did make clothes, make dresses, and he worked with her. Fashion in, in Italy at that point was built as kind of a, an aristocrat's pastime, almost. It wasn't really seen as, as a real business, as a, a, a real calling. Um, and as a world for somebody not of that class to break into, it was incredibly difficult. And the Italians always liked to look good. Always. And always had, you know, they wanted things to be beautifully made. It's part of the Dolce Vita to look, to look lovely. It's a, it's a present to your fellow humans to make the most of yourself. He was a very precocious child. He was, he's, he's said himself he was um, obsessed with, um, with aesthetics, with appearance. Um, he relayed one um, memorable incident from his childhood when um, he cried until he was sick because his mother tried to make him wear a bow tie with a navy blazer and he felt it ruined the visual effects of that. He, he knew that he wanted to be a designer. Um, you know, he probably came out of the womb flourishing something silky and a pair of scissors. Four years after the war, in 1949, he goes to Paris to study at the Champs de saint -Dicale. And after that, he, he gets a job, having been turned down by various other um, designers, he gets a job at Jean de Cesse. Desse's style was feminine was elegant, was very much focused on soft materials, on a kind of soft, pliant, traditional idea of femininity. It wasn't staid, but it did have a kind of coquettish sexiness to it. And I think it's, it's interesting actually to look at his work and to link it with Valentino, with Valentino's manipulation of materials, with what we recognise today as the Valentino style. He spends several years there, during which time he seems to work mainly on his own on his own design, so it was obviously a wonderful experience. And during his time in Paris, what Valentino was able to do was, was to learn technique, um, was to, to learn about materials, to learn about dressmaking, and really to, to learn uh, what was then the, the one place that you had to be if you were, wanted to work in fashion. And from there, he went for two years to work with his old friend, Guy Laroche, who had his own small couture house. In 1959, he returns to Italy. Siren call of the motherland is irresistible, back to Rome. And in 1960, he opens his own fashion house on the Via Condotti, which is a very sort of swanky shopping street in Rome. In the, the 1950s and 60s, in Italian fashion, there were really um, three places that were fighting for, for supremacy. There was Milan, which was emerging because of its proximity to Lake Como as the heart of modern Italian textile manufacturing and also kind of a burgeoning ready-to-wear scene. There was Florence, where a number of different houses were based, such as Pucci and also um, Salvatore Ferragamo. The shoemaker, also Gucci, had emerged from Florence. And that was a region that was really known for its excellence in leather making. Um, and there was Rome, which is where the Italian equivalent of the haute couture, the Alta Moda, was based and was being shown. Valentino chose Rome, which is where their house is still based today, even though most other Italian um, fashion labels are based in Milan. Milan has never, ever had the, the glamour and the sort of earthy allure of Rome. 
Rome at the time, of course, it's the golden days of Cinecittà, the golden days of La Dolce Vita. Everyone was in Rome. One of the things that really established Valentino on a global scale was his designs for Monica Vitti in Antonioni's film La Notte, which obviously had a, a global impact. And one person who was in Rome filming Cleopatra was Elizabeth Taylor. And in 1961, for the opening night of Spartacus, she asked him for a dress. And he made her this white number with an ostrich feather hem. And he's almost never looked back. I mean, I, I think having worked with the Italian film industry, what Valentino realized was that that, that was giving him excellent exposure and exposure that he couldn't get from the fashion magazines. So you see him continuing to work with people like Fellini. He chose to shoot his summer collection on the set of Fellini's Eight and a Half. You know, if you contrast the, the clothes that Valentino was making with Italian directors with, for instance, the Givenchy clothes that Audrey Hepburn wore in Roman Holiday, that was a French version of Italian clothes, and what Valentino was creating had, had an authenticity to it. And I think also it's really that there was a kind of seduction because the, these films were represented a lifestyle. Valentino, very early on, sort of sussed the power of, of celebrity endorsement. You know, Ch Ch Chanel didn't, didn't need that. She would have been very uh, snobbish about that, but... I think Valentino just loved it. He just loves living the jet set life and hanging out with celebrities. You know, in the 60s, he was very friendly with Jackie Kennedy. Uh, when she married Onassis, she wore a Valentino-designed wedding dress. And, you know, he's continued to be friendly with celebrities, even now. And, um, you know, you see pictures of him on, on his yacht with uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, Liz Hurley, or more recently, you know, he's friends with Anne Hathaway, and you think, mm, it's quite an age gap, but... Anyway, it's mutually beneficial. Particularly as American magazines like Vogue and Harper's Bazaar and also British magazines were still looking at, to France to set the fashion pace. Italy was a competitor, but it really wasn't stealing a march on Paris at that point in time. But with Valentino partnering with the Italian film industry, um, suddenly his name reached a, a, a new prominence. Business partner and lover, uh, Giancarlo Giametti, and, uh, and that's when the business really starts to become more than a sort of small-time house. The comparison that's often made is between Yves Saint Laurent meeting Pierre Berger because um, both sets of men, Berger and Saint Laurent and Giametti and Valentino, um, became both personal and professional partners. In 1962, Valentino famously showed his collection at Palazzo Pitti in Florence. I wouldn't say that Valentino's no-colour collection was a revolution, but certainly what, what it did do was mark him out against the, the landscape of Italian fashion, Mark him out as somebody that was willing to experiment with new ideas and someone that was trying to look at things with a fresh eye. Uh, really, the, the whole idea of Italian fashion then being known very much for colour, the kind of colour you see in, in the work of Emilia Pucci, for instance, and the idea of someone rinsing that out and, and really trying to do something quite pure was very newsworthy. He saw it as kind of a pivotal turning point in his career. Valentino's No Colour collection won him the Neiman Marcus Award. He was very important in America as well, of course, at this time, as he's bound to be dressing Jackie Kennedy. Because there isn't a class system in America, so all these American women could want to be like Mr. Valentino, could want to be as cultured as Mr. Valentino. Also, the V became his signature. Chanel had her double C, he, he had the V. There is something flashy and plunging about that V, but, but that, he, he wasn't a sexy designer in that way. I mean, some of the clothes were, but as I said, you know, it was, it was always much more about being ladylike. Hence, you know, Jackie Kennedy, later Onassis, could wear it so much. He had this silhouette that was a slightly raised waist. You, you, you could call it a princess line. It makes your legs look longer. It's very elegant. Even when it was mini, 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 it somehow manages to look demure and classy and, again, quite elegant, you know, because that, that's a difficult length to make. That mini doesn't always look elegant, but with the long sleeves and these round necklines, 
uh, sometimes little collars. It, it's very, very charming, you know, and it made Liz Taylor look beautiful. I mean, she is beautiful, but she didn't have the easiest figure. She's quite short and her weight fluctuated, but he was very good at dressing so-called real women. I mean, Princess Margaret, Liz Taylor, real in some sphere. There was a kind of casual leisure wear that was emerging in Italy that was really a counterpart to the French haute couture. The thing that I think is very interesting about Valentino in that context is that Valentino wasn't about and isn't about leisure wear at all. It's not about sportswear, it's not about ease. Valentino is very much about an Italian version of haute couture, an Italian interpretation of haute couture. Valentino would never have done a Pierre Cadin. Valentino would never have done an André Courrèges. Valentino would, would never have tried to destroy haute couture in the way that they did, in the way that Yves Saint Laurent did in the 70s. It was never about kind of tearing down those, those bastions. It was about reinterpreting them, it was about redecorating them in the Italian style. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. Every designer needs their signature or their codes. And one of Valentino's strongest is the colour red, a particular red. It's now called Valentino Red. It was inspired by a trip to Barcelona. It was actually inspired by the interior of um, Barcelona's cathedrals where he first saw the colour and realised its impact and ever since then he included red dresses in every one of his collections. And it is a very particular shade of red. I suppose you'd call it scarlet, but it's warm. There's quite a lot of orange in it. And I think the thing about Valentino Red is it flatters practically everybody. <laughs> In 1969, he started his bag collection. There was a perfume launched called Valentino. He was on his way to becoming really hugely, hugely wealthy. In 1969, he'd opened pret a porter boutiques in Rome and Milan. 1970s saw him, him also opening in New York, spending a lot of time there, hanging out with a lot of the most famous and influential people. I think Valentino had a real knack for knowing where was going to be the city of the decade. And, you know, if the 60s was Rome, the 70s belonged to New York. He, he went to Studio 54, he knew Warhol. I mean, there are, there are Warhols of Valentino. He hung out with Bianca Jagger. He dressed all those, those women. He launched a children's wear line called Oliver after his pug. I mean, the pugs are almost as famous as Valentino. He had Lots of pugs, always this sort of little entourage of pugs wherever he went. I guess you could say that having dressed everybody else in the early 80s, Valentino also dressed a car when from 1983 to 1985, Ford put out a special Valentino model. What Valentino did very cleverly was to capitalise on the fact that he had established a name, he had established a style, he had established himself in the US as well, by launching a ready-to-wear line that capitalised on his kind of haute couture credibility. And in the way that fashion was going, it was the ready-to-wear that started to make the money. It was the ready-to-wear that really became the engine that, that was powering the house of Valentino. But at the same time, Valentino continued to show haute couture. And Valentino continued to show haute couture today. And really what his ready-to-wear became about was translating elements of haute couture into, into a ready-to-wear idiom. It, it became about trying to take those details and rather than create a completely different identity for ready-to-wear as Yves Saint Laurent had done by calling it Yves Saint Laurent Rive Gauche, it, it was about a version of haute couture in ready-to-wear, which, which is quite an old-fashioned idea, but, but really Valentino, I feel, was the Italian label that was able to do it successfully. In 1998, Valentino sold his company, although he stayed on as chief designer for both the ready-to-wear and, and haute couture lines, which by that point were being presented in Paris. Really, it was about stability of the company. It was about ensuring a future for the Valentino name. 
He was offered 300 million for his fashion house. So I don't think it was a, I don't think it was a terribly difficult decision. <laughs> It was 2007 when Valentino finally decided that the time had at last come for him to retire. After what? Pushing 50 years of Valentino. There was a little misstep finding someone to succeed him. They had Alessandra Facchinetti, who's good, but it, somehow it was deemed not to work. She did a couple of seasons and then they appointed Maria Grazia Ciori and Pier Paolo Piccioli who had always worked as a team together and they'd been previously at Fendi working in accessories. Um, and they'd done incredible accessories there with Silvia Fendi, very successful. And uh, so they moved across to Valentino and it's just been the most incredible marriage. Mira Grazia Churi and, and Pier Paolo Piccioli have really established a discernible identity for the house. The previous identity was Mr. Valentino. It was embedded in him. He was what people were aspiring to be. But the challenge that, that they really faced was kind of crystallizing that into actual garments that, that they could create without his presence. Really what, what they've done is, is established a certain type of, of femininity. Um, and also, oddly, pulling it right back to the start of Valentino, to the Alta Moda, to that focus on hand craftsmanship that Mr. Valentino learnt at Jean Dessay and, and in French haute couture. It's very based around that. They still produce haute couture collections with programmes that number the thousands of hours it takes to create all of the clothes. They're just such a good fit. They understand that brand so beautifully and they've managed to modernise it while completely keeping it in the spirit of Valentino, by which I mean that they, those silhouettes that I was talking about earlier, the slightly raised waist, the long, narrow sleeves, the high armholes, the, the round, modest necklines, they've taken that and sort of exaggerated a little bit to make it more modern. They love medieval influences. All the rich embellishment that Valentino was famous for, that's it's all there, but they managed to make it look sometimes almost quite austere. It's a very beautiful, magical blend. In my opinion, they've really established a, a strong foothold in menswear. Um, the way that Valentino uses camouflage is almost the way they use florals in women's wear. They've transferred camouflage to becoming kind of a masculine floral. Um, it being a pattern that can be used across different types of menswear to denote masculinity in the same way they use florals to denote femininity. And they also mix it with some very severe, plain, but very luxurious sort of double-sided cashmere clothes. And it's, it's just completely magical and it's been such a huge success that they've had to expand the couture atelier, which is pretty amazing in this day and age. These two designers were the designers that Mr Valentino himself approved of. I think it actually proves that, that when a designer appoints a successor, generally the designer's always right, and Mr Valentino certainly was. <laughs> One thing for which Valentino has become famous, and perhaps even more so since his retirement, is the luxury lifestyle that he and his partner share. They've both, in fact, released books. I mean, Valentino did a book about secrets from his table of, you know, of entertaining tips. And Valentino, for me, has always been about much more than the clothes. It's been about the lifestyle. It was about Valentino's clients wanting to hobnob with him. It was about Valentino's clients buying Valentino clothes so they could live like Mr. Valentino lived. You know, they could have his yachts, they could have his palazzos, they could have his collections of, of old master art. I think th there's very much this idea of, of Valentino turning himself into this kind of acme of, of chic. Then there's the 150-foot yacht. There's the stories of the three private planes, one for Valentino and Giancarlo and one pug, one for the four other pugs, one for the staff and the baggage. He has a collection of miniature thrones, of course. He clearly himself rather relishes, you know, the tag of the king, the emperor. W and Women's Wear Daily came up with a really fantastic um, fantastic nickname for Valentino, which was the Shake of Chic. For them, it was really about Valentino as this arbiter of taste. Valentino as the person that gave the best parties, Valentino as the person that decorated his homes in the best way, Valentino as the person that 
had the most luxurious yacht. It wasn't necessarily about having the biggest, but it was about having the best. And that was, it was Valentino kind of representing as a name the, the kind of, the high life. Valentino representing how things should be done. He's not someone who is known and will be remembered chiefly for great big innovations in design. He's about style, if you like, rather than the cutting edge of high fashion. I mean, Valentino's incredibly successful today. Um, I think really what's happened very interestingly and very quietly over the last seven or eight years is that the name has been cemented, that the name now means something, and it means something separate to Mr. Valentino. He's still present at the shows, he still applauds the designers. But really, it, it, Valentino has been established as a label in its own right, separate to Valentino the man. And what that's actually done is set it on a, a firm footing to continue for another 50 years. I think, in a sense, he'll go down, maybe, not for this innovation or that innovation, maybe not even for Valentino Red, but as the last of the great couturiers, the one who went on working in it for almost half a century, at a time when obviously a lot of catwalk shows are going to be about innovations which may or may not make it through to the way we most of us actually want to look, Valentino has stood and will stand for something else. Valentino in Paris was seen as an Italian. Valentino in Italy was seen as a, a middle-class boy. He wasn't seen, you know, he wasn't the aristocrat, he wasn't the thing to aspire to. Whereas in America, I think there was this idea of, of him belonging to this other world of kind of European culture, and really as being a sort of embodiment of that. This kind of old school, old world, authentic, aesthete, the kind of thing that you'd see in, in the turn of the century. And that that's what Valentina represented, kind of an aristocrat of taste. Yeah.